الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a new uh, Friday حلقة In this series where we talk or where we take a, a thematic approach to the Quran, to the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Last week we started with سورة هود and we, we've come a long way I believe we're halfway through the سورة and we saw how the surah is specifically uh, directed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his early companions, and uh, it puts their, their their struggle in context. And uh, and this context is historic a historical context, and that's what previous prophets and messengers went through. So it sends a message to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you are no exception to what uh, to the human condition when it comes to responding to uh, messages or divine messages that came to them and this was the case with with prophet so story of prophet Nuh specifically uh, takes a huge part of the surah and then we saw how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even like with the with the with the story of Nuh how even his his relatives we said the closest some of the closest ones to him his wife his child his son did not uh, accept the truth they rejected the truth and thus they chose disbelief the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had for example his his uncle who was very supportive very helpful uh, and uh, played a major role in protecting the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam against the plots of the people of quraysh yet he refused to accept the truth and um, so these things uh, again they, they definitely have an impact or they had an impact on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah said to him innaka la tahdi man ahbabt walakin allah yahdi man yasha you do not guide who you love allah guides whom he wills and the will of allah is tied up to his wisdom uh, and allah does not do any injustice in Allah la yadhlimu an-nasa shay'a as Allah says that Allah does not extend any injustice walakinna an-nasa anfusahum yadhlimun but humans uh, do injustice or practice injustice against themselves and against their fellow humans as well so this is the historical context another context is the faith context Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we're going to see towards the end of the surah how Allah places this predicament and this, uh, these challenges, this difficult time in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the context of aqidah, of faith. What, what is the meaning of the, of the mission of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it meant to be a piece of cake? Like a very easy mission, straightforward, just convey the message and people would believe and you move on? No, in, in a sense, there is a wisdom in it being a struggle. And that's to raise the Prophet وسلم, and the believers. So when, when accepting faith and Iman is surrounded by a lot of challenges and difficulties and oppositions and real risks, uh, this makes the reward of the believers way greater than it would be had the mission was very easy and the law refers to this fact in the quran where he says uh, and thus we test you by means of one another we, we test you and the tests reveal two outcomes the ones who are good are elevated in goodness and the ones who choose evil and they choose the way downward, they are sent even further downward. So that's what the test, the, 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 the tests make the difference and the, the variance between truth and falsehood, between good and evil, very manifest and clear. So that's what the tests are. So, Allah, so there is a meaning, there is a benefit, there is a great wisdom. Although obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love to put his servant in hardship. If you were to look at hardship and suffering individually, singularly, without a context in which it occurs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love for believing servants, for good human beings, 
to go through suffering or to experience pain. Uh, there is a hadith Qudusi in Sahih al-Bukhari, the very famous hadith of al-awliya, uh, where Allah talks about, um, you know, whom are the ones he loves. And it starts with, abdi bi, I am to my servant as he thinks of me or as he or she believes of me. Um, and, and then eventually Allah says, uh, in, in, a, in towards the end of the hadith, that Allah hates that pain comes to the believer, comes to the to the good person. Allah hates that. Allah doesn't like it. Now that's singularly, that's the singular meaning. But again, Allah's wisdom is encompassing, so it does not approach things only through their according to their singular meaning. It also looks at how they occur in a context. And sometimes there's a trade-off or there's a conflict between the singular meaning and the contextual meaning of things, the environmental meaning of things. So, so Allah allows suffering and pain to come to the believers and to the ones that he loves because eventually this is going to help them grow in faith and this is going to uh, bring from them, elicit from them more patience. And Allah rewards immensely for patience. So when you look at the grand scheme of things or the overall context of how things play out although Allah does not like suffering for the believers he allows it to happen because a greater good comes out of it happening within a specific context so this is the religious or the aqidah the belief context behind you know uh, uh, the, the experience of the prophet sallallahu and the early muslims in mecca allah puts it there and towards the end of the surah, Allah even puts it further in context, in a, more in an ac actional context. In this sense, Allah gives practical advice to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the early Muslims as to how they should respond to, to resp how they should respond to these difficult times. And th this is why I said, if you, if you remember last week, that this surah is very important for people in da'wah today. Uh, if you are adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the early generations of this Ummah, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and you're striving to practice Islam and be true to Allah and do the right things, nowadays it's extremely difficult. It's very challenging. And it's not only the society will uh, have a, a pushback against you, but sometimes it's your immediate family and the closest people to you. Uh, so these are huge and big challenges and, and we should not uh, take them personally, but we should put them in the context that this surah puts them in. And this is why it actually gives us profound advice. And we, sh we should look at our experience in the light of the experience of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the experience of previous prophets and messengers. And that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions their, their, their stories. Here, so I believe we we came to the um, yeah I believe we dealt with the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam and his people Thamud and how they they killed the miracle that Allah gave them, which was the camel, the she camel, and its own uh, uh, baby camel. Um, it was a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they ended up, you know, killing it, slaughtering it. And, and that brought about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, upon them. Obviously, they gave, they gave Prophet Salih alayhi salam very difficult time, a very, very difficult um, time. And we also have a reference here to the angels coming to Prophet Ibrahim. So we here we, we, we are talking about verse number 69. So, and remember or observe when our messengers, these are angels came to Prophet Ibrahim with the uh, good news. And the good news is basically the relief for Prophet Lut alayhi salam and that his people with all their evil are going to be punished. He's going to be re relieved of that. And they are going to deserve what they, you know, what they have incurred upon themselves. And also the Bushra, the good news, something specific 
to Prophet Ibrahim السلام, which was the good news about Allah granting him Ishaq, the, his son, Prophet Ishaq, or Isaac in English, alayhi salam, and that Ishaq would have his son Yaqub or Jacob. Um, and again, this came as a shock because Prophet Ibrahim السلام, was very old and his wife was way beyond the age of uh, conceiving, yet Again, these rules are made by Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, can make exceptions for his creation as a sign and as a way to support and, and uh, help his, his uh, messengers, prophets and, and messengers. Then Allah, uh, then the, they, they give him the, the good news of what's going to happen to the people of, uh, of Lut because they deserve what they you know, earned. So they're going to get that. And Prophet Ibrahim was concerned for Prophet Lut alayhi salam. Uh, eventually, they came to Prophet Lut. And again, he was very, like, it was a very tough time for him because, again, his people uh, practicing whatever they practiced, the, the major sin that they were engaged in, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, they even wanted to practice it with his guest, seeing these guests, because angels came in the form of humans. They would approach prophets in the form of humans for the most part. So they saw them and they said, okay, these are new people. So again, so, so it shows that this tendency, this evil tendency within them consumed their lives completely, that they could, that they could only see people in the light of, of that crooked desire. That goes against human nature, pure human nature. And um, eventually what happened that they gave him the news that you are supposed to leave, escape, you and the believers. Uh, but here again, your wife is not going to leave. Why? Because she was with those people. She was a disbeliever. She, she rejected faith. And she, um, uh, she was basically supportive of the lifestyle. Or that, or, or again, of all of the, the behavior and uh, the practices of the people of Lut. And eventually, Prophet Lut السلام, and the believers with him, they were saved and the other ones were destroyed. So it's good to think about how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the companions, the early companions, how they were receiving this, how they were reading this. Because they were suffering a lot from their people. There were some people within their family members almost every one of them had uh, family members who were opposed to the truth and who were against it. Um, and just looking at the facts on the ground, so to speak, at that time, it didn't seem that Muhammad وسلم, or his people had any chances of becoming uh, dominant or becoming a major power or even just getting freedom for themselves to practice their faith. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing them that things change. All, all it takes is that Allah says one word, that Allah wills something into existence and everything changes. So we should not, uh, oftentimes we humans get immersed, we get consumed in what we call facts, but this is the limitation of our perception. It's what we see, but that's not the, you know, the, the, the whole spectrum of reality. This is a very tiny bit of, of the, the, the huge you know, spectrum of reality. So it's important for us to see things not only through our eyes, but also through our hearts, through the unseen world. Things are in the hands of Allah. Allah says that if Allah wants something, all it takes is that he says to something be and it is. So that's all it takes. Uh, we humans live in our own limited, um, I would say, uh, ecology of causality, yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond that. Allah transcends all of this. He, he's the one who created causality in the first place. Then Allah uh, talks about uh, Prophet Shu'aib who was sent to the people in Median. And... Um, Median, um, it seems Median was in the north of the Arabian Peninsula, the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. 
There, there, there are, I've seen a couple of opinions that say Median is more towards Iraq, but not necessarily in that in the eastern side or the northeast of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, I've seen a couple of uh, maps, uh, and uh, it seems to Median. It seems, and 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 this actually coincides very well with uh, with the story of 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 Prophet Musa alayhi salam, because Musa alayhi salam, when he left Egypt, when he escaped Egypt for the first time, uh, and he met the righteous man, and he married. The daughter of the righteous man. This was in Median. Prophet Musa السلام, also went there. And obviously, we know Prophet Lut was before Prophet Musa. Oh, sorry, Prophet Shu'aib was before Prophet Musa. السلام. So it was to the northwest of the Arabian Peninsula, around that area, or to the south of Bilad Sham. This is where Median is. And the biggest thing about the people of Median, other than disbelief, or their disbelief led them to a practice, because they did not, again, observe the rights of Allah and their associated partners with Allah. What they did, they used to cheat. They used to cheat, and, and it was normalized. Cheating became normalized in terms of trade. So he said to them, والميزان, Do not cheat. And... Uh, do not perform, you know, the weighing of the goods deficiently, because again, the, so there are two ways. There is, uh, there is mikyal and there is mizan. This is for trade. So mikyal is basically selling by size. You sell a cup of something or five cups of something, and this is what we. This is this is what's common among the Arabs. So this is why you have, for example, uh, al mud, which is two handfuls. You have a sa, which is, I believe, four hand handfuls. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it was by size. So they would sell wheat by size, for example. And many of the scholars say there is more barakah in this. There is more barakah in this because the Prophet ﷺ made a lot of dua to bless the, the sa and the mud of Medina. Uh, but there's another way of making trade and business of measuring, and that's basically weight, which is more common today. It's more common in today's world, which is basically using kilograms or using, uh, you know, pounds, etc., whatever. So this seems that this was both of them were used at the time of uh, Prophet uh, Shuaib among his people in Median. So he said, "Do not deficiently perform, you know, the weighing and the the sizing of the goods that you sell." And he says, "I see you are living in goodness; that you are in a very good state." You, you, you are being blessed by Allah with abundance. So I'm afraid that by you acting unfaithfully towards these blessings, because when you cheat, you're violating the rights of Allah. Uh, so you're undermining you know, the gifts he's giving you. You're not acting faithfully and uh, with, with, with gratitude towards it. So when you do that, this is the sure way to, to deprivation, destruction towards the blessings being taken away from you. Because if you do not observe them, if you do not cherish them, they're meant you know, for your own benefit, your own sustenance. So if you do not observe them, ethically speaking, and this shows that ethics and morality is weaved into, is, is, is woven, actually it's woven into the fabric of reality, of how, of practicality. How the world works. So he says, I, I see you in a very good state, and I'm afraid that an encompassing punishment would fall upon you. You would incur a punishment, a destructive, complete punishment upon yourselves by acting unfaithfully. Um, yeah, and he calls this, he says, He says, when you do that, you are actually bringing about mischief, corruption on the land. And obviously, they, this was, again, this was not only a practice. And, 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 and here we see in the Quran the connection between aqidah and practice, lifestyle. So if people don't worship Allah, it's easy. It's, they are inevitably going to create a lifestyle that will violate moral principles. So, so aqidah and practice go hand in hand. Uh, again, they treated him with ridicule and they said, verse number 87, Is it your prayer? Like this thing that you do, this ritual that you perform that is actually 
getting you to say to us or getting you to develop this opinion and say to us, do not worship what your fathers, forefathers used to worship and that we do whatever we like with our money. Um, so they're, they're sarcastically say, you are a wise man of understanding and guidance. They were not praising him. They were just mocking him. It was a form of ridicule. It was a sarcastic. That it was done sarcast, sarcastically. And, and here we see something, a very common theme between their times and our times. And it shows this is a consistent thing among people who don't worship Allah or choose not to worship Allah and not to act ethically. And that's basically entitlement, claiming full ownership that if I own something, then I have the right to do whatever I want. There is no ethical principles. Because they said, oh, that we do whatever we want with our wealth. It's our wealth. We use it any which way. We do whatever we want with it. Uh, that kind of entitlement, mine, me, this is not real because in Islam, whatever you possess is actually belongs to Allah, but it's given to you as a loan because Allah is testing you by means of it, how you handle it. It's a trust and Allah is going to see how you handle it, how you use it. Are you going to use it ethically? Are you going to use it in a socially, resp socially responsible way? Are you going to use it in the way to enhance the overall benefit of society? Are you going to follow the moral and ethical principles? Are you going to obey the rules of the one who already gave you these things in the first place? That's the question. But again, they don't see that. They don't believe in that. They reject that and they claim it to themselves. This kind of entitlement. Then he says to them, basically, you know, if I am given a clear signs from my Lord and he has given me, he's provided me with something. He uses the word rizq like provision. And he's talking about understanding, about wisdom, about the truth. And it shows that the best provision is actually the truth. It is rizq. It is provision from Allah. And he says, I'm not seeking to oppose you. That's not my goal. So I'm not doing what I'm doing just to stand out, just to be different. And because this is a common thing among people who aspire to change in society. And it's, it's a human tendency. And uh, because sometimes people want to be different. People just want to have an impact, any kind of impact, just for the sake of standing out, just for, this, for the sake of being different or for the sake of making others wrong, look wrong. This thing is, is very common. This is why anyone who, by the way, engages in advice, engages in da'wah, engages in teaching people, they, they, they have to work hard. They have to purify themselves because these things are woven into basic human nature. That um, I want to get attention. I want to I wanna prove people wrong. I want to be the savior of society. Again, it's just, it's about me. It's self-serving. So... You're just looking for mistakes and you just want to point them out. That's not a good place to come from. So Prophet Shu'aib here is making that clear that he's, he's someone who's done this inner work and he knows where he's coming from, that this is not the, the, the motivation or the motive behind my advice to you. I'm not seeking just to oppose you, just to be different. I'm not doing that for any personal reason. I'm doing that because of its intrinsic value as an ethical violation, what you are doing. In uridu illa al-islaha mastata'at, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be a good influence in society. I'm trying to bring about the truth, the proper reform. That's what I'm seeking. It's not about me. There's nothing personal there. And he says, my success in this mission is by Allah. It's not even like... It's not dependent on me. I, 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 I'm supposed to do what I have to do. I'm supposed to follow the, you know, take all of the, necess the necessary measure measures, do everything I can, but results are, don't belong to me. This is something that is in the hands of Allah. So I'm coming just from a moral place. Uh, then he says, I put my trust in Allah and I'm eventually going to return back to him. So it's not about this life. It's about me fulfilling my mission and being dutiful to Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he says to them and it's a beautiful advice he says wa ya qaumi verse number 89 wa ya qaumi la yajrimannakum shiqaqi an yusibakum mithlu ma asaba qauma nuh aw qauma hud aw qauma salih and he says oh my people don't let this natural sense of opposition you know when someone tells you you know that's wrong automatically your ego responds no you want to defend yourself automatically without even getting a uh, giving that argument or that advice a fair chance without even giving the person the benefit of the doubt that's an ego it's it's a very it's it's a uh, it's it's like the imp impulsive response the immediate response of our ego um uh, it's it's like uh, again so so people who do that they follow the caprice of their own nafs so he knows that shuaib knew that and it shows he had a good understanding of humans so he said to them and let not your sense of self defense you know stand in the way because this is not about who's right and who's wrong there are serious grave eternal consequences for this there is a punishment in this world and it will lead to eternal punishment in the hereafter so he reminds them of the punishment that fell upon the people of nuh the people of hud and the people of salih and the people of lut and and it seems that they had news they had history about that they knew it so again but they did not respond to him positively they uh, ridiculed him further they said we you know what you're saying doesn't make sense we can't comprehend it and we see that you don't have any power or position among us so why would why should we listen to you and had it not been for the people who are around you who might just support you etc or who look up to you we would have stoned you to death eventually again they brought upon themselves the punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah mentions the story of prophet uh, musa alayhi salam uh, very briefly it's more of a just a reference and towards the end of uh, fir'aun pharaoh and his people uh and here verse number 100 sort of summarizes the surah here allah says that kamin anba' alquran qussuhu alayka minha qa'im wa hasid wa ma zalamnahum verse number 101 wa ma zalamnahum walakin zalamu anfusahum fama aghnat anhum alihati alihatuhum allati kanu yad'una min duni llahi lamma ja'a amru rabbik وما وما فما اغنت عنهم الهتهم التي يدعون من دون الله من شيء لما جاء امر ربك وما زادهم غير تتبيب الله says these are the news of the previous towns that we relate to you some of these towns are still there but some of them are are only ruins now Allah says we did not do injustice to them but they brought their own demise upon themselves they brought punishment they incurred it upon themselves and thus their false god that they worship the false gods that they worship did not avail them did not help them did not rescue them um when the command of your lord came about they actually increased them in loss so allah is saying don't worry oh prophet muhammad everything's are in the hands of allah if allah allows this difficult situation to last to extend then definitely there is wisdom everything has its own time everything comes comes in the plan of allah comes at the right time and we should not try to you know play the role of god and make that some kind of judgment we should entrust things in the hands of allah we can make dua we can express a wish we can ask allah to make things easy for us we can ask allah to help us we can when we should seek a solution and we should seek a way out and we should seek a better you know to move the situation in the right direction but again we don't get attached to to the results we 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 try to remain trusting of allah and we open up to whatever allah brings about because he's going to bring the best as long as we trust him this is how things work our mission is to do the right thing and allah says eventually that on the day of judgment um basically this is verse number 105 till 108 Allah mentions that people will end up into two parties those who will be happily forever in paradise and those who will be in misery and abyss for eternity so there is a few advice here I want to highlight because they are very powerful 
Allah says to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, verse number one, uh, hundred and twelve, hundred and twelve. So, how do you handle such tough situations? How do you handle that? Yes, people would talk about getting politically active, um, start doing things, etc., etc. These could be done, but these are supposed to be built on a foundation. And what is the foundation? It's actually religious and spiritual growth. So Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, remain steadfast as you were commanded. That's how you respond to all of these plottings and all of this opposition and all of everything that is going on against you. Be straightforward, remain steadfast upon the path as you were commanded along with those who have joined you and do not go overboard. Do not exceed the limits. Allah indeed is a watcher over you. This shows that obedience. You obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and there's enough guidance in Islam for how to handle tough times and difficult times. Uh, yes, we learn from life, but again, whatever we learn from life, we need to put it within the parameters of what Islam tells us, within the guidelines of Islam. Uh, the, the problem is what we see, and we've seen throughout Muslim history, and this led to disasters, and we are seeing today, is many Muslims are actually, and, and so-called people who are carrying the da'wah, uh, many times they do some kind of a secular, religious secularism, as, as paradoxical as this sounds. Because it seems that they are acting from an assumption or a pre presupposition that practicality can be taken from ideologies and political philosophies. And that Islam is all about religiosity and devotion. And, and, and that's, that's a faulty understanding. It is a faulty understanding. Yes, the lessons that we learn from life, from experiences of life, from history, um, are supposed to be integrated within the framework of Islam so that they abide by these guidelines, by the principles of Islam. Instead of us ha having two inconsistent um, systems that we're trying to function according to. And, and the Muslims, the Muslim scholars who really excelled were people who managed to bring those together and, and making the system of Islam dominant over experience. And that's not to diminish experience, but, but to put it in context, to put it in context and avoid any segment of that, exper that experience that constitutes a violation against uh, a true uh, principle of guidance. And Allah says, And do not lean towards those who have wronged themselves, those who have committed injustice, because this would lead you to the hellfire. And Allah would not support you. Somebody might ask how to do this. Verse number 114, Allah says, الصلاة and establish the prayer. Although this verse was actually revealed uh, as appears in the books of Tafsir, it was revealed in Medina, a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, I committed a sin. So he had a, a mistress from before Islam and then he, he, after Islam, he happened to meet her and he engaged in some acts of promiscuity with her and then he, 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 he was in remorse, pain, and he came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he said, I did this and I did that. And the Prophet وسلم, turned away from him. Then the Messenger وسلم, received revelation and he says, where is the man who asked about, asked me the question earlier? Uh, the man was brought and he says, Allah sent to me this verse. Allah says, and establish the prayer at the both ends of the day, in the morning and the evening. And um, and also during the night. In al Hasanati Indeed, good deeds wipe out and remove 
evil deeds. That's the justice and the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and that's because we all humans, every human being, all humans err and we fall in mistakes. And the best of those who err are the ones who fix their mistakes. Um, so when we make mistakes, when you do righteous deeds, they wipe out, automatically they wipe out evil deeds. And that's an advice for people who have fallen in sin and they want to you know, make amends and rectify their situation. This is a reminder for those who are trying to be, uh, trying to remember. And be patient. Because sometimes your plans won't work out. Sometimes there's nothing you can do in the face of an overwhelming situation. What do you do? The work becomes internal and that's patience. And patience requires trust that Allah is taking care of affairs, that it's not all in your hands. And, and that things are happening according to a divine plan, although they are overwhelming and seemingly negative. But Allah is going to bring good out of this. It goes wrong only to go right. So be patient. Allah does not waste the reward of those who do well. So this is advice. This is practical advice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the early Muslims. And there's a beautiful verse here, here verse number 117. Allah says, Your Lord was never to destroy a town due to their injustice as long as there are people in it who are rectifying it. And this is the importance of people who enjoy the good and forbid the evil. It's important. You might see the efforts of these people as unfruitful, but as long as there are people who are rectifying mistakes and advising and reminding, although this, they, they might, people might not be responsive to them, but these people are a safety for, 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 their, for their people because Allah is holding back the punishment because of these good people, because there is some kind of correction and rectification and goodness taking place. That's, that's, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala values goodness. And here Allah says verse number 120, uh, Allah concludes here the surah, and if you remember last week, we said it's sandwiched. The stories are sandwiched between a reminder to the Prophet وسلم, to remain steadfast upon the message and be patient and do the right thing. Uh, and in the middle, Allah mentions the stories of the prophets and messengers to help the Prophet ﷺ remain firm and put his uh, struggle in context. So Allah says, and thus we relate to you the stories of the prophets, of the messengers, so that we make your heart firm. Because it, it contextualizes and helps the Prophet ﷺ make sense of, of, that, of that phase of his message, of that experience. And in this revelation, what has come to you, what has been given to you is the truth and the reminder and an admonition. An admonition and a reminder for the believers. And then say to those who don't believe that you do according to you know, your belief, according to your stance, whatever you choose, we are going to act upon our faith and our belief. And wait, every record is going to be set straight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sooner or later. And the, the surah closes with And to Allah belongs the knowledge of the, of the seen and the unseen. It shows that we refer things to Allah. Knowledge, we refer that to Allah because we don't know everything. And, and, this, and this makes us, again, not jump to conclusions to judge our situations when they don't seem to be favorable. Why? Because we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what he's doing. We don't have all the details. We don't have all the numbers. So that's a reason to just put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So put your trust in Allah, rely upon him. Allah says, وَإِلَيْهِ يُرْجَعُ الْأَمْرُ كُلُّهُ All of the affairs return to Allah. All of them will be handled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So although there seems to be oppression and violation of Allah's role, uh, rules, you might think, oh, things are getting out of hand. No, Allah is allowing this. 
and for a greater wisdom. For a greater wisdom. Much good is going to come out of that, although it is evil in itself, singularly. But in that context, Allah, and, and this is the power and the might of Allah, even evil things, Allah allows them to happen in a context that is going to extract and distill, distill more benefit from them than the harm they bring about. That's Allah's wisdom and his qadr. And Allah concludes with the surah, وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِغَافِلٍ أَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is not unaware of what you do. Allah is aware. Allah sees everything. Again, Allah is patient. And Allah has a perfect plan for everything. But again, it's our haste sometimes that we expect Allah to do things now and solve problems now. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So this is the surah. It's a very beautiful surah, very powerful, and brings a lot of peace and comfort to the heart at times when you know Muslims struggle, even in Muslim majority uh, you know, communities and societies. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease and to uh, make our hearts firm and uh, to make us patient and give us trust in his plan and in the way he handles the affairs, just as he gave that to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and his companions through this surah and others. And this surah is a very clear statement of, uh, of this way of you know, dealing with, with situations, complex situations like this. Okay, so I think that's enough for today. Uh, inshallah, next week we will move to Surah Yusuf. That's very interesting. Many people, because it's a, it's a complete story. The whole Surah is a story. And the lessons are dispersed within it. I'm not sure what kind of approach we're going to take to the Surah. Are we going to take a detailed approach? Or are we going to take uh, like a quick um, sort of, uh, uh, how can I say, skim through the Surah? We'll see, inshallah, how it goes. Uh, so inshallah see you next Friday Jazakumullah khairan Wassalamu alaykum Wa rahmatullahi Wa barakatuh